My name is Caitlin and I co-run a Berlin-based collective called CoQuo um, with two other amazing humans who I think are lurking in the chat, Mel Powell and Rainia Kim. We founded CoQuo about two years ago and our mission is to sort of establish or challenge status quo that we see affecting uh, industries at the intersection of science, technology, art, and music. Uh, and we do so by facilitating events and workshops such as this one. Um, so I guess I will talk very quickly about the, the sort of overarching theme of the series because this is our first live event. Um, but the series is called Music Futures and Simulacra. Uh, I think that word simulacra scares a lot of people. Um, it's a Baudrillard thing, uh, also mm -hmm. widely popularized by the Wachowski siblings in the film franchise, The Matrix. Um, so if you've seen any of those films, you're more familiar with the concept than you think you are. Um, but sign or simulacra is essentially like signs and symbols in replace of reality. And over the last few years, I started to notice signs and symbols replacing all of my realities, uh, and that was certainly exacerbated by the ongoing uh, global COVID-19 pandemic. And rather than sort of take on the dystopic approach uh, that the Wachowskis did with the Matrix, I was more interested in uh, utopic, uh, a utopic approach, uh, sort of building and imagining utopias and new futures, uh, and specifically for the music industry, because that is the industry in which I am involved. Um, so the simulacra, simulacrum that we are here today to discuss are NFTs and the surrounding crypto and Web3 infrastructure, which we will get into. And I am so pleased to be joined by six people who I see leading the conversations and whose uh, ideas and knowledge sharing has greatly uh, informed my own knowledge. Uh, so rather than introduce all of you myself, I was thinking uh, we could go around, everyone could introduce themselves and sort of say what their relationships to NFTs and Web3 is. Maybe Chloe, you wanna start? Um, hi, um, I'm Chloe Thompson and I am a sound artist and sound designer working Yes, with sound and also spatial audio. Um, I guess sort of the brief of um, my interest in NFTs is I'm always interested in like new tools and new forms um, for access to media and also for artist support. Um, I'm also interested in critique and like building um, better tools that work for everybody and um, notions of um, how to or I guess modes of making things accessible to many different groups of people um, and building with accessibility in mind. Cool, uh, I'm just gonna go in order of people that are on my screen. Maybe uh, Matt, you wanna go next? Hey everyone, yeah, I'm uh, Matt. I'm uh, an artist. I've been, um, I guess, involved in Web3 for quite a long time about 2013, 2014 was when I first started getting involved. So pre-Ethereum, um, which feels very like 600 years ago. Um, yeah, uh, I'm involved in various capacities. I teach a class on this stuff at NYU I've been doing so since about 2016, 2017. Um, and yeah, I've just been kind of involved in the space. Like I lend my thoughts to a number of different projects over time. And as an artist, um, I've been working on you know, both kind of extending the tool set and thinking about different applications for it for my practice specifically. Um, yeah, so have released a bunch of NFTs recently, for example, which is kind of an interesting or fun, fun trip. Um, yeah, so really happy to be here. Cool, thanks, Matt. Uh, Sherry, do you wanna go next? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, thanks so much, uh, Caitlin, for, for having us, um, for organizing this. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I guess very briefly, uh, I'm Sherry. I run a music and tech newsletter and a membership community called Water and Music. I've been doing that um, basically full time for around a year and a half. And before that, I was a freelance writer in a more traditional sense, writing for a lot of different publications uh, like Billboard and Forbes about um, music and tech trends, uh, but also with a more industry focus, but also always trying to keep the artists at the center whenever possible. Um, in terms of my first 
experience with like NFTs and blockchain. Actually the first ever music industry conference I ever attended, this was back in 2015 when I first started writing, um, was at the Berkeley College of Music. And that was also the first time I ever learned about blockchain. And it has such a strong imprint in my brain because it was on a blockchain panel that just ended up basically being a shouting match between someone from a PRO and someone who uh, was like founding a startup that was trying to disrupt PROs. Um, I found that very entertaining and, and humorous, but also definitely telling just for, at least in the years since, like how the music industry in particular, especially like for mainstream, you know, incumbent major companies would respond to blockchain. I think thankfully, this like newer wave of activity around NFTs is much more exciting, much more experimental, less about, you know, trying to get um, major labels, publishers, PRs, et cetera, on board, and more just about being super scrappy, doing what you can kind of on the ground, definitely, you know, led by independent artists. I'm sure we'll dive into um, all of this today. So uh, yeah, that's why I'm especially excited for uh, this conversation, just for this uh, landscape in general. Cool, thanks. Uh, Mikhail? Yes, um, my name is Mikhail Stangl. Um, I came into NFTs, to be honest, uh, not by accident, but also through research, you know, basically facing or analyzing what we were facing as a music industry in that post the time, the disruption that was COVID, you know, ultimately, you know, COVID was a really good time also to kind of reassess, uh, will we engage in new forms or will we just continue to use, you know, the ecosystems, the platforms, the industries that kind of more or less turned out to be fairly abusive. And what interests me the most in NFTs is actually the fact that it's for the very first time an incredibly participatory technology like web3 is incredibly participatory that can basically reproduce a lot of the collaborative um communal processes that electronic music i come from an electronic music you know grassroots culture perspective and a lot of that is about collaboration and redistribution you know there's like roles are not as clear cut who's the promoter who's the label who's the activist who's the audience it's all one thing all contribute to one common goal and to scope out more powerful configurations, both on a technological and structural level to, to, to salvage that and potentially, you know, to carry it over into a new age. That is what I find incredibly interesting and most powerful that I've seen in my involvement with especially grassroots community in 25 plus years. So that's what that participatory element is what keeps me very excited and busy in this. Cool, great. And we will uh, get into more of your work with Zora because I am very interested to ask you more about that. Um, Zola Jesus and Verite, I want to ask, like, are you cool with us? What what name would you like to be referred to? Would one of you like to uh, introduce yourselves first? I also want to say just like kind of fangirl vibes. I saw both of you at CMJ in 2014. Uh, and I was just, I was like, oh my God, I've seen both of these people at the same festival that doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, it just made me feel like old and excited. <laughs> same. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, you can call me Nika, but you know, Zola Jesus is also more, more obvious. So I'll answer to either. Cool. Uh, do you want to give a brief intro to yourself? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So my name is Nika. Um, I live in Wisconsin. I make music and I've been doing it for about uh, 10 years now, but it's been my my passion my entire life. Uh, music is an incredibly divine experience for me. And um, being a part of the music industry has been extremely disenchanting and disillusioning. And it really uh, made me struggle with my love and passion for music, having to navigate the corporate structures. Um, and feeling like I had to play a game outside of music itself. It just felt like a giant distraction to the main goal. So when I discovered um, blockchain and crypto and NFT in, in relation to arts, I felt a lot of optimism for it. And I liked that the NFT space is so much more diverse in terms of what it can be. And as someone that um, who's music and, and uh, creative ideas sometimes take different shapes that aren't just audiophiles. I liked the, the freedom in that. So I was very excited when I first realized I could make audiovisual pieces, you know, and then there, there's a place where I could present them and sell them. And, and um, it was deeply, deeply inspiring and exciting for me. Um, so that's kind of what drew me to it. And also just trying to rebuild um, 
uh, the an ecosystem or an environment or a world for music that is more habitable for uh, creativity to to permeate and grow um, because the current systems that we're that we have are very um, detrimental to that. So yeah, that's why I'm here. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and Verite, would you like to round this intro session up? <laughs> I muted now, I'm not. Um, yes, of course. Hi, I'm Verite Kelsey. You can call me either as well. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I am, it's funny you mentioned CMJ because I feel like the landscape of the music industry is constantly shifting. And I, uh, similar to Mikhail, like pre was presented at the beginning of COVID kind of seeing a landscape where uh, the traditional path that I was taking as an independent artist wasn't going to be feasible in the way that I was currently navigating it. And I kind of viewed NFTs as an escape hatch in a lot of ways. Um, I think we're so used to now the algorithm determining who sees your work, um, platforms owning your audience and having more access to your audience than you do. And I view NFTs as a solution to a lot of these things. And, and like with was also just said, it completely broadens the creativity of as a musician and as an artist, um, the mediums that we can use to uh, build our communities. And so I'm really excited for the freedom that NFTs and the use of Web3 and blockchain um, to build ecosystems and fan communities uh, can provide for artists. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, I guess it probably goes without saying that an NFT is a non-fungible token, um, but I also wanted to quickly sort of uh, maybe provide a definition of Web3. Uh, and because I know a lot of people are sort of not familiar with the concept, uh, I'm going to give a, give a stab at uh, explaining it, but I might turn to some of you to explain it better. Um, but the way I've heard it best described is like, web one was the bringing of like all of our systems online so like most notably like commerce and e-commerce and then web two was sort of being able to react to those systems with user-generated content so like uh facebook and soundcloud and youtube and now web three is sort of a like decombustion of those systems a decentralization of those systems um does that kind of cover it Matt, I feel like you're kind of the resident expert in Web3, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that that does cover it. it it's, it's become one of those terms in the sense where many different people have many different definitions of it. But I think that, yeah, the most common definition you touched on, which is, you know, <clears throat> if Web2 was to be considered the kind of social web, right? Like, um, which we've seen over the past decade kind of consolidate into very, very centralized hierarchical power, right? Like we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we have very little say or decision-making power in that process. Um, and we don't really see, as uh, Verite pointed out, you know, we don't really see very much kind of like upside in that. We're kind of like beholden to the decisions that are made on our behalf. And generally those decisions are made for a very small group of people, most likely the the, the kind of the, the benefit of the platforms themselves. Um, Web3 is decentralizing that process. There's a number of kind of like uh, native concepts to Web3, the idea of owning a stake in the platforms that, or the protocols that you participate in is one kind of native idea. The uh, Another native idea is the idea of forking, so the ability to look at the code of the, of the protocol or the platform that you're using and say, actually, I would do this a little bit different. What if a group of us got together and changed the code in such a way to, to meet our purposes? Um, so yeah, so, but, 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 in a nutshell, it really is just a decentralization of, of what we know. And from that, there are like a gajillion different um, potential applications and externalities uh, uh, to it. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And then I guess to kind of start where people are maybe most familiar with NFTs is like the traditional auction system, the like peoples of the world selling things for $60 million or whatever. Um, and Sherry, you've shared this, I'm gonna put this in the chat for folks to look at, but this sort of chart about like the like expectations and profit, uh, I, I think it like really hit the nail on the head for me. So sort of, there was like this first wave of like music blockchain hype in like 2016, 2017, and then like all this disillusionment and then it kind of came back recently, um, NFTs, smart contracts, Ethereum, all of this. 
And then sort of, I feel like we're maybe in this like phase that you've written in here, slightly enlightened disillusionment sales tank. This is all useless unless we actually take the unique capabilities of crypto seriously. Um, so I'm interested in maybe picking apart that sort of like bursting, that tanking that we're seeing. I know you've reported on it a lot in Water and Music. Uh, there's sort of a big indication that like sales of NFTs are really like rapidly declining. Um, but I would imagine that probably all of us here, our interest doesn't lie in the like $60 million auction sales, but actually in like the more long-term uh, application of the technology. Um, so does somebody kind of want to jump in and talk about maybe that bubble um, and, and, and the bursting of it? Maybe Sherry, you're a good person to talk about it. Sure. Yeah, I can I can briefly talk about it. And yeah, definitely interested in hearing um, this group's thoughts on it too, given that you're all like working with the tech directly. So um, yeah, so and I guess this uh, graph that Caitlin, you shared uh, in, in the Zoom chat, and I shared on Twitter was definitely informed by, you know, going back to the, that very first panel that I went to on blockchain in 2015, seeing kind of the hype die down, specifically on this um, application around applying not even like NFTs or cryptocurrency, but the underlying blockchain tech to rights management. Um, whereas like the the hype and kind of lack thereof now in the current cycle is more about, uh, yeah, just about these like auctions and more about the markets created around like NFTs and like crypto specifically uh, as like a subset of blockchain. And looking at the data, um, I'm planning on like publishing a longer piece about this, but I think in May, um, music NFTs based on like all the sales that I was able to track, um, they generated around uh, 2 million in sales compare this to February and March when the sales totals were going to um, like 25 to 30 million. So that's like a 90% dip basically. And um, there have been other like academic papers published recently that show a similar dip across the board. If you look at not just in music, but um, across all NFT marketplaces. So I do think music is a, is a representative microcosm of what's happening um, in the market at large. So yeah, you'll see all these headlines that are saying, oh, like the market has crashed, you know, that the, the hype is over. Um, that said, I, I do, I, I think like actual uh, development activity. So I think this is also a, a really big difference from kind of the first wave of hype when kind of the uh, like rights management type apps were trying to make it in the music industry. Certainly like development, um, and like minting a collaboration activity, I don't think has died down. I think we're seeing uh, for sure like the dying down of these. I actually thought we were gonna see um, like a, a more expensive auction than the people one, but I guess we haven't seen that yet. Uh, probably is a good thing <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, people being less focused on the dollar side and actually more focused on, yeah, one of the most interesting like longer term applications. Um, like just because the market has died down, does it mean that these apps or these companies, protocols like Zora or like Foundation um, are are dead. It's probably like the opposite. Uh, I think artists are definitely, um, yeah, like still super excited and still collaborating, still rolling out really interesting campaigns. So um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Curious to hear other, other people's thoughts, but it's kind of the higher level of yeah, what's happening. Yeah, I'm interested like Verite, Zola Jesus and Matt, you've all minted um, NFTs. Chloe, I don't think you have, have you? No. Um, and I guess I'm interested to know sort of like what your experience of that bubble bursting was. Uh, Matt, I know you and Holly didn't mint until quite recently. And I'm curious to know if that was intentional, actually, um, or uh, I, I'm interested to know kind of all your three, the three of your experiences as um, artists. I minted something in, I minted a couple pieces in like February or March, like pretty, pretty early on in the year. And I was very excited about it, very excited that there was a whole new way for me to create uh, unique pieces of art and to be able to find homes for them and find support for that. Um, the quickly, I was sort of disillusioned by my experience, not because I didn't sell them, which I did, but because I felt like the intentions of the people buying them were not um, as sort of honest or straightforward or merely purely supportive as I would have liked. And I, I kind of started to feel a little resentful of the fact that 
this thing that I created with my heart and, you know, wanted to sell, but at the same time wanted to sell to someone that actually really loved it was instead being used as a means of potentially um, profiting off of speculation. And there's a lot of things there that I can go into, but I can maybe do that later. Um, I just felt sort of disillusioned by the intentions behind the people that were buying these NFTs and the financialization of what I was doing. Um, and that's kind of my, my quick vibe check on that. I, I can speak to this a little bit as well. Um, I think that I, I, I kind of stepped into the NFT space with really zero idea. I, I kind of minted on a whim just to try it out um, and was lucky enough that a fan of mine uh, was heavily involved in the crypto space. And I think part of what's contributing to the bubble is that it's such a niche audience that is educated and has access to crypto and has the financial means in which to kind of buy things at this much higher price point. Um, which I don't necessarily think is all bad, right? Because when we look at music, the idea of having this quote unquote investable layer where music is ubiquitous and accessible to everyone, uh, that to me is inherently good. And then providing an additional layer where somebody who has means and wants to make an investment in an artist has the ability to do so. But I think that in the long term, that's not sustainable. There are only so many people who have that sort of means to make those investments. And so I think kind of to what Sherry said, like now we're going to have to build and figure out how do we widen this so that it's not only these wealthy collectors who are able to purchase these NFTs, it's actually the community of the artists who now is able to participate, whether that's in fractionalization of like the works themselves and the art themselves, whether that's through DAOs and, and social tokens and, and building communities in that way. And so I think that this dip is actually really good to what Zola just said, to where we can now create this path and ability for regular people and and diehard fans who don't have you know five grand to spend on an nft where they can have a piece of something that they love at a price point that's affordable to them yeah, yeah. i think oh you go matt <laughs> I, um so i i think this is uh chloe and i had a conversation um for the coco radio show in march and this was like a sort of a huge um, discussion of ours, you know, like only people with money can afford to experiment with experimental money. Um, and I think that's, what's like the kind of concerning to me and like disillusioning to me. Um, but Chloe, do you maybe want to talk more about that? Because I think sort of your discussions, like our discussion together and some of your other work that, um, discusses that really open. I, I wasn't even really thinking about that, um, and naively, I guess. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, everything I'm hearing is definitely stuff that like has had me be hesitant and sort of hang back. Um, I really just want to put forward that like we've seen so much critique of the NFT space and various platforms, proof of work over proof of stake, all of this stuff come up. And I just really want to make clear that I think critique is a form of care. And I know a lot of people get defensive or care and are deeply invested in making these spaces. Um, but the time and energy that I think people have put in, and maybe even sometimes people just sort of jump onto things, is is meant to be caring in this way. Sometimes it's angry and mob-like, but it it is, at the end of the day, like we want things to be better. Um, and I do feel like I'm really interested in hearing about your um, ideas around redistribution efforts with Zora, Mikael. Um, and I'm thinking about like, the sort of future of the NFT landscape um, versus the now and this like cash grab attitude, which has felt really extractive. And like as an indigenous person, that makes me think a lot about how this like kind of cash grab rhetoric, um, transactional rhetoric has fueled movements around resource extraction um, and the emergence of new like physical colonies on indigenous land, like mineral mining. Um, and how that exploits child labor to make our computers work. 
and like the tar sands in my nation's land. And also presently with like the mining ban in China, a bunch of mining is potentially moving to North America. And there's not really ongoing conversations about that, like energy resource extraction, like on the negative sort of side of things and like the complexities of the issues at hand. But also we have server engines that like fuel streaming and all of these things and everything we engage on, including the Zoom call right now, is extractive to some extent of an energy resource. Um, so I think like having sort of a balance is important there, but really like to bring it back to this, like right now the cost of gas is really high when like Ethereum 2 comes out and there's more proof of stake in like the mainstreamed models like OpenSea and Foundation, which use Ethereum and tend to be really popular. Um, I think that cost will go down um, and it's really interesting now, like months into it, Tezos um, and the platform hit at, hit hick at neck. I can say things out loud that I've read on the internet. I swear, um, it has actually like more daily traffic than any of the other platforms, and that's proof of stake. And it also like seems like there's a really diverse group of people there. Um, and one of the kind of concerns that I have around this like sort of mass people still jumping on to this cash grab attitude um, of things is when you're doing proof of work and you're minting these things and then they don't sell like that transactions already been complete. And I feel like right now we're at a really great point to really push the proof of stake concept and also think about how we can like really get together because it's been sort of this replication of like, I'm a popular artist or I'm getting discovered in the crypto community, thus I get much money. And what I'm more interested around like in around like 3.0 and decentralization is not that actually. It's like, how can we collectivize and create independent agencies which allow for like group safety and redistribution of resources and like thinking about the past record um, sort of label model, not in like the problematic way where artists have been um, excluded or like the history of like black artists not being in contracts, but like how advances were made at varying tiers of people's career to help bring them up and like support their practice and the press and how that supports producers and mixing engineers and all these different people who are part of making work. Because I feel like a lot of the entry point to this conversation has been very concentrated in a time where like as artists were expected to be the producer, the mixing engineer, everything should be on one digital audio workstation. And like, that's also not sustainable. Like how else can we integrate these ideas of decentralization and collectivity and collaboration, like true collaboration, conversational and ultimately interdependence in the sense of like, if I'm making work, I'm dependent on like the people around me for inspiration and subsequently like sharing inspiration and dialogue with people. So I was a little all over the place, but like, I'm just sort of thinking about all these bits and pieces and in relation to like my own personal relationship and ethics um, and sort of where I come to the conversation from, which is like, I guess I'm kind of NFT neutral, but I'm also always really excited about like new spaces to make art and more people doing like AV and getting really interested in these collaborative forms. Cause like, I've always done like audiovisual works and like I work across a lot of different mediums and with a lot of different people. And it feels like a platform that actually, or a format that's like so in line with my own work. Um, but I've had this hesitancy because I'm not exactly sure like which like marketplaces to go to. Like I, I'm releasing a game as an album next month. And I was like, I guess I could mint this, but it's not web-based. And so it would really exclude people from actually getting to play it. And so, and there's not a lot of apps that would let me do that, that I'm in line with. Um, so yeah, it's like, there's there's sort of a thing there. I don't know. There's a lot, sorry, talk too long. No, no, all good. Um, I was thinking, I mean, you sort of uh, mentioned Mikhail by name, but I also wanted to sort of hear from Mikhail about, we've sort of mentioned a bunch of stuff like, we've talked about NFTs, we've mentioned like social tokens. There's like been a few sort of like buzzy things that we've, um, uh, spoken about here already. Um, and Mikhail, I was, I know that Zora is like involved in like auctioning and minting, but you are also involved in facilitating social tokens. Um, and I'd love to hear more about sort of, uh, if you could sort of just like 
give a brief description of like what the, both of those things are and Zora's involvement in them um, and sort of how those things, um, like what the long-term implications and like possibilities um, with Zora are. Mm -hmm. um, so over the last like half hour, a lot of things were, have been said that, you know, I kind of want to, before I go into Zora, a little bit address, but I think, because I think they're really necessary to understand the evolution of the, of the, I hate saying the space. It's like the kind of business lingo that everybody works on, like moving in the NFT space, you know, there are many on ramps, but you know, I'm, I, I try to sound more professional than I'm actually am as well. So I'm going to use those words. So ultimately, you know, what happened is there's both a, there's a cultural clash on one hand, um, crypto, which I am not an advocate. Uh, you know, I don't even own really any crypto and I've been highly, uh, suspicious of blockchain until very, very recently. And the reason why I'm involved with blockchain and Web3 technologies and all of this is not because I'm so uh, supportive of it, but because I'm so critical of it, because I want to guarantee that positions out at the fringes, you know, positions that are not centered, positions that might have, let's say, less biases in terms of that's the only reality that we saw. So this is how we conclude the world should look like you know, are thought of. And ultimately, you have to take into consideration that a lot of crypto, you know, a lot of blockchain is a very particular social demographic group that has a very particular you know, view on how society works. A lot of that comes from the very, you know, let's say libertarian financial world where, you know, the way you constitute yourself within society is structured completely different. And that is the thing about Web3. This is about the thing with the smart contracts. You move actually on a level of an unconstitutional level where you basically provide rule sets of how you constitute yourself in a social system that is utilizing, let's say, you know, data, uh, smart contracts, technological systems to constitute govern and process itself, you know, and the question is, of course, what do you center in terms of what is your definition of, of societies, you know, and that is the really exciting thing coming to why I am so particularly exciting about Zora and about Web3 is ultimately um, what you create is blueprints. Now, if you, the way you look at society is one that centers, you know, where sovereignty is the goal, where also, you know, decentralization is an attempt at sovereignty, you know, only me and no one else and no one can access anything that I have, not the state, not anyone, you know, not anyone. This is a way to look at decentralization. But if, for example, the way you look at how society constitutes itself is rooted in solidarity, where anything that you do is rooted in a mutual, in a practice of mutuality with Web3, you know, you can basically put those principles into the smart contract, make them part of the blueprint, not something that you tick as a box at the checkout. Here's your one euro solidarity if you want to, maybe, you know, buy some carbon offsets as well. But they are, can be part of the technological blueprint. So anything you do in the system is rooted in solidarity. But, you know, you have mismatches of a lot of that industry kind of living in this Californian reality of what is technology, you know, what is e-commerce, what is, you know, business, how do we relate with each other? And then you have the rest of the world, which does not operate like that, not in values, not in the way the music industry works, not the way the art world. And they made a shortcut. You know, you have people that are already in crypto, you have NFTs, and only half of the story was told. NFTs are provenance. If you know who created it, when they created, who you can document who owned it, bring that provenance to something that is kind of web two with crypto buzzwords, which are centralized marketplaces. And this is only half of the story of NFTs because NFTs ultimately are not about provenance. NFTs are just data containers that wrap stupid medium, a JPEG as a stupid medium into rich into operable data. Now the question is, what is this data wanton that you have? What are the properties? If you tell people it's just provenance and bring that provenance to us to sell it at a 15% commission, then you're only telling the half the story. But if you say, that all of this metadata, now we come to the point where Zora is, and your definition of Zora is unfortunately a little bit outdated because the social tokens were just an experiment when we kind of were looking at those technologies and see what can we do with it. And ultimately what we decided is to build an infrastructure that is open source, that allows anyone to use NFTs to make two fundamental decisions. A, what is value? You know, value can be something monetary or it can be something abstract, you know, social value, participation in a, in, in a community, something that is not monetary. And B, how do you distribute that value? That allows you to create a matrix in which anything from maximizing your personal wealth, um, you know, sell the 
asset at the highest price possible. Two, new models of co-creation, co-ownership and redistribution are possible. Only if you have the tools that allow you to put your point along that matrix. Now, a lot of crypto has made a shortcut and decided that the only action in that matrix is the auction, you know, sell the asset to the highest price possible. That is the only thing that you do. But this is, again, something that I've been very criti critical of uh, also with the so-called legacy systems. You know, Spotify and Instagram were designed with one thing, to profit the bottom line of those who designed it. All the functions within those systems were kind of the outcome is already predefined because the outcome needs to be the bottom line of those who designed those systems, you know? And the same thing is also when you say that on your platform, the only thing that's open as possible is auctioning the asset away to the highest price possible. You also omit all the other possibilities because that one option benefits one thing, the bottom line of whoever set up that technological system. Now, in my case, if this is, in my personal opinion, if this is what you want to do, then yes, you made an informed decision that within what you do, your artistic practice, your, your economy, that is the best possible outcome, but it's not the only outcome. And this is what we have to do. We have to give artists the tools to make those decisions informed um, in an informed way and then benefiting from the outcome of those decisions because a lot of those things don't need mitigation. They don't need, you know, third parties that kind of inject themselves into this revenue stream. They can still participate. They can still create a value proposition, but that value proposition cannot be justified by just injecting yourself into that part where the money, you know, passes one hand to the other, which is what Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all of them do. So, and this is what we're trying to do with Zora is basically to create Web3 building blocks based on a protocol that is interoperable. So, and we've had that already, and I'm going to stop really quickly. You know, people have used the Zora protocol to build Miro. Miro is a platform that is now the de facto standard for kind of publishing in crypto that is based, you know, on the Zora protocol. It's not auctioning away articles. It's a way, way more complex way to engaging, you know, creation, co-ownership, redistribution based on a technological framework that allows that interoperability. Catalog.works, where Verity and Zola have been active, is also based on a Zora protocol. So what it's about, and this is what I find so exciting, now that all, and I find it actually amazing that a lot of like crypto rich dudes, you know, experimented with all of that, you know, and they were the ones who harmed themselves with all the speculation, because now we come at a, a uh, point where all this the froth, another word I learned, uh, is gone. And now we can actually build a social layer. We can actually reproduce the elements of collaboration with richer, more complex tool sets to actually do what NFTs really can do, which is being building blocks within rich ecosystems that require community content, stuff like that. So this is what we're trying to do. Um, I know this was a bit more compl complicated and longer answer, but it's really exciting. You need to take the time to also deconstruct because you said, you know, oh, does the space took the most logical, you know, the natural traditional form of auction, but is it really traditional? No, because a lot of those use cases were adapted without questioning their, you know, genesis. Why are, why are we doing this? Why is like the ETH price, the social signal that we've sent, you know, facing the audience, there are other design decisions, but they were being carried over from one project to the other without deconstructing and questioning, are those the value systems that we want to inject into those conversations? And a lot of that is changing now. Yeah, amazing. I think, uh, you, yeah, you pointing that out there, like I, that was just my brain trying to like put labels on this like community token auction, but like that that's just- Sorry. Yeah, it's like uh, quite I, confusing on our web page, so we need to clean that up. As yeah, well. <laughs> but it's so oh. like I, I think it's interesting that my brain just not like naturally navigates to these terms that I'm familiar with from a web two space when there's like way more out there to describe, um, like what you're like the work that Zora is doing. Um, Matt, I see you have your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, I agree with a lot of what was said. Um, I wanted to address the bubble a little bit. Um. Uh, which is maybe jumping back a little bit, but I have like a list of things from what people have said. Um, first off, I think it's really, really important speaking about, you know, carrying over things that people are familiar with from the Web2 space. It's really important to understand that one of the kind of 
pros and cons of decentralization is there is no one thing in this space, right? So like if someone is enthusiastic about Web3, the good news, right, is that there is no central actor telling you how to interact with it. That's kind of like an advantage of it. Um, the bad news, of course, is that there's no central actor to impede somebody from doing something you don't like, right? So that is the kind of bargain that you enter into participating in this space. Um, and I think uh, to go back to this whole idea of the bubble, I'd be really curious, for example, Shri, you maybe know more about this than I do, um, to see what, you know, how much that bubble was constructed by very, very few actors, right? Like the way I categorize kind of the beeples, the blouse, that these kind of big kind of attention grabbing uh, headline sales initially, there were very, very few, um, I, I would argue, likely very coordinated um, uh, uh, actors involved in spending that money. And if you follow the money in most cases, um, what we actually saw was a kind of a decentralized marketing campaign, which I think is kind of a new phenomenon. We're not used to it, right? We're used to the idea of Google saying, okay, we're going to work with Ed Sheeran and we're going to pay Ed Sheeran a million or $10 million or something to stick his face on a billboard. We're used to seeing that. What we're not used to seeing is a bunch of anonymous people bidding on artworks whose um, you know whose big headline grabbing sales also inflate the price of a token right and that is and and uh, metacoven for example who bid on the beeple and spent the 69 million bucks basically pretty much came out and said uh, said the same thing right i am where he was working on a he is working on like a fractionalized um, nft platform and he saw it as a good investment because making those big headlines was going to bring more attention to what he was doing and as a result you often see cases where people you know people drop something like 30 million dollars which of course sounds like an insane amount out of money. But then when you follow the token price, a billion dollars of value gets added to the company, right? So that's a marketing campaign, right? That is that is what marketing is. You spent, you invest money in order to gain returns uh, later. Now, of course, the media loves this, right? Because the media who, I mean, it's shocking to me, honestly, I've read like New York Times reports on this stuff that, that you know, wouldn't pass high, high school uh, examination requirements in terms of their level of knowledge about the space. That shows you how much of a challenge we have uh, uh, moving forward, but the media loves those stories, right? Big, big tickets, uh, big, big kind of narratives. They kind of, they kind of bought it. Um, meanwhile, um, you know, a, a protocol like Zora, I could mention many others, have been quietly building something that is completely at odds with um, uh, with that mentality and with those with those objectives. And sadly, you know, when you do have a bunch of coordinated actors bringing a lot of money to a space, bringing a lot of attention to a space, you don't get to decide in a decentralized kind of uncoordinated uh, uh, ecosystem when people choose to pay attention to things. So sadly, as a result of, you know, uh, the big sales and SNL making jokes about things, now everybody associates the Web3 space with, you know, ridiculous valuations for things that are quite clearly entangled in some kind of dodgy Dodgy, uh, uh, dodgy stuff. In in the in the interim, people have been selling artwork, um, which is really cool, right? Like coming from ten years of uh, not valuing art in any way. Um, there's a whole lot we can talk about, like uh, the the ins and outs of, of how that has worked. That that to me is a net positive. Other things I will say, right, on top of this, um, it, trying to play devil's advocate a little bit. This is the most uh, international development of of a web that we have ever seen. Period. That is un, un, undisputable. Right, like if you look at these protocols, um, I would push back a little uh, against the 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 kind of the, the characterization of this as being a Californian thing. What is relieving about this space, in fact, is that it's not a Californian thing in the slightest. Actually, many of the actors in Web two and many many of the kind of VC uh, contingent uh, uh, that we've come to characterize as being as being uh, 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 synonymous with the internet don't like this because it, it's a significant power uh, 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 power struggle uh, that, that we're witnessing happening. Matic, Polygon, for example, the layer two proof of stake um, uh, uh, protocol that is doing quite well was fully developed in, in India. This has broader um, this has broader political connotations, right? Like moving from a scenario where Twitter has the ability to take down the account of a politician overseas, right? Somebody in California has the ability to interfere in a democratic process overseas. Um, decentralizing that and allowing for these tools to be robust, um, now again, uh, censorship online is a long uh, a long discussion that one can have, um, but I think that we could agree that that uh, changing the nature of the web that we use and changing the nature of the tools that we use so that not every decision is being made in a boardroom in California is probably a net positive, even though there, as I said before, there's going to be negative things that are associated with that, right? Like there's lots of people, there's lots of bad people who who like the idea of of not being censored, um, right? And so so I, I do want to push push forward on that in the sense that, that part of the reason you know, NFTs have been a thing since about 2016, 2017, the idea of 
you know, a non-fungible token has been around since before any of these networks worked. It's, it's a very old idea. Um, many of the ideas that we would most likely all want to see are actually in development. And in a sense, I think there's been a bit of a sabotage campaign um, between you know, highly coordinated actors uh, pushing for a very specific vision of how these things work and a media that is very, very thirsty to write about bad news. Um, and there's a lot of good news. And I, and I do think it's, it's really nice to have uh, Michael and, and some representative from Zora here because I think they're one of the examples of, of, of a protocol that, that gives, me, gives me a great deal of faith. I'm, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna leave it there. But I think the bubble, the bubble thing it's a it's a uh, you know it, it really depends how you how you look at it I think if you take away many of those big ticket kind of marketing spend uh, sales uh, things things look look very different yeah I agree with that um, Chloe I see your hand is raised um, I was gonna say something and I can't figure out how to unraise my hand um, but I guess sort of one of the first points that you made, Matt, around like they're not being um, essentially they're not being a manual, and I think that's why it's important to have discussions like this with people who have like participated and had like great, bad, neutral experiences uh, with these mediums. Is there's not actually a manual for how to do this, and it has existed for some time, but it's ever changing and like in flux, and things are still being created. And so the more that we actually talk about process and what we actually want from this um, and goals around it and actually mainstream that conversation, the less that this other stuff, it, it, it's, you know, like um, the more people who can collectivize around certain types of action, the more change can happen. Um, and that's really my point of interest in NFTs and like jumping into that landscape in some sort of eventually land. Um, when I find a way that works for me and for my audience appropriately is like okay well how can this actually it's so new like we're talking about things that have not really been in existence for like more than a decade most of the time and like crypto like bitcoin didn't start too long off and i think about like how by having these conversations now and by having critique now and by having like hopes and dreams and goal planning now um, as collectives, as individuals, and like talking and centering collaboration and narratives around redistribution, as well as sharing and like authenticity, um, how in five years from now, like tools might be more like mainstreamed or centralized um, for people that do meet all of those goals. Because while we're like talking about this hype maybe being very short term or the bubble, like so the bees and Christy have done NFTs in the past like six months. And I don't think that that is really gonna go away. Like there's some longevity here, um, which in my mind is like kind of the most negative version of it. Like I'm kind of against, I'm pretty against the capital A art market um, and the objectness of um, goods and like value, um, but conceptually if some of these things could actually like pull forward into the alternatives and we can turn our focus there and like make those alternatives habitable for people and agreeable for people and primarily like proof of stake then we've got something good potentially you know yeah certainly and i think sort of where this discussion has gone and it's amazing is like this really like macro view of like nft or like this real macro like wide zoom out approach to like nfts and uh crypto and web3 uh and i maybe just want to take a moment to sort of zoom in a little bit on um like the music specific use cases for nfts and crypto because um i think that that's where i see a lot of people get lost um is that like there's sort of these big macro discussions. And then you have like Pitchfork writing an article about NFTs and like the New York Times writing an article about NFTs. And no one really knows how it all like slots in. And like, I think for a lot of people outside of like the big auctions that they see, um, they don't really understand like how um, blockchain can help like administer music rights uh, or like the sort of use cases that um, NFTs and and like the web web three space. Now that Mikhail, you said like you kind of poked fun at like the word space. I've heard how many times we've all said it, uh, and it's quite funny. Um, but yeah, to kind of if if we could zoom in a little bit on um, 
like music specifically and sort of like what uh, traditional modes of music consumption and exchange that NFTs and Web3 can innovate. Um, maybe Sherry or Zola or Verte, you want to talk about this? Because Uh, yeah, I guess I, I definitely want to uh, yeah focus this question on um, on Zola and Verite, given that they, they yeah they are um, have like worked with us as artists. I guess the so I, this is like my personal opinion. So I am uh, yeah I, I am seeing like this notion of like fractionalized um, ownership come up a lot more um, in terms of like applications for for music NFTs. I know Verite you've worked on. Um, one such campaign where you gave, you know, a percentage of, um, you know, royalties and, and of revenue around um, one of your recent singles to uh, a fan of yours, which is really great. Um, that said, I guess, uh, I think the current reality still is that the actual like rights transfer is still happening off chain. So like, I guess you're it, like, you're selling an NFT and, you know, a fan can get an NFT, but then you still have to like sign a more traditional, like, recording or publishing, you know, rev split agreements separately in a more, you know, traditional sense, um, give them a split in whatever distributor you use, like DistroKid or CDBB or whatever. So I guess the NFT is like a, like a channel and I guess a fully decentralized and open and uh, in many ways, you know, permanent channel to kind of uh, show and signal, I guess, from the owner side, you know, oh, I, you know, supported this artist. I now have a stake in their song. Um, that could be great, but the actual like nitty gritty of it is, um, all off chain. So I guess that's, uh, yeah, just like one thing that I'm sure a lot of people are like working on right now to try to move all those things on chain. Um, I guess what I've been like trying to also like learn up and learn and read up a lot more on myself. And I think is really interesting are like applications that um, can like entirely happen on chain. So uh, for example, like what happens if um, as an artist, you create a, uh, a DAO, for example, uh, with a lot of, like, not just your um, team, but also a lot of maybe, like, fans that have supported you, uh, you know, across multiple platforms for a certain period of time, and you give them um, a stake, like, not just in your own growth as an artist or, like, as a, you know, growth of a certain, like, artist community, uh, but also, like, a say in, like, I'm sure a lot of fans, um, especially certain genres, would love to um, have a say in certain like marketing campaigns, for example, around a song, um, you know, like how like certain kinds of events to hold or certain kinds of experiences to hold online. Um, I think like DAOs in particular, social tokens, there are a lot of, uh, and I guess uh, interesting that, you know, on the NFT panel, we're like talking a lot about applications outside of NFTs, which I think is actually great. Like I, I do want to <laughs> like expand people's awareness of applications of blockchain and crypto just outside of um, NFTs, but uh, yeah, so that's, I think, uh, the, the notion of, you know, giving fans a stake, giving fans, like, uh, ownership, like, actually bringing them tangibly on the growth journey of an artist's career is an idea that resonates with, um, with a lot of artists, for sure, and a lot of people in the music industry. Um, the current, like, Web2 uh, models that exist are uh, very slow or, like, not very precise, and I think um, like Web3, uh, block, a lot of like Web3 blockchain tools allow for it to be much more open and immediate um, and, and precise than the tools that we have, that we have previously. Yeah, for sure. I mean, maybe uh, Zola or Verite, you want to talk about sort of like that immediacy that you've seen. Um, I'm really interested in the ways that like NFTs and Web3 can like enable fan communities. Like I think you see, we see a lot of like people thinking about NFTs and crypto in like valuing music in like a strictly fine, like in financializing music, but I'm interested to know from like artists who have minted um, and, and sold, if you felt like any, what the reaction like from your um, like fans and like art, uh, like fan communities has been. Speak to that a, a little bit. So from my perspective, I think it's important to have two conversations. And I feel like we've been having these two conversations. There's the idealism for what NFTs can be. And then there's the pragmatic and practical reality that we still have to 
um, be in relationship with these more antiquated systems, especially within the music industry, um, to make that work because not everything is going to be decentralized. When you look at, you know, how royalties are collected, you know, that's a 50 year old, very clunky system with a black box that very definitely benefits the holders of those black boxes. Um, and so from my perspective, I, I tend to always be on the more pragmatic, like hands and feet on the ground uh, solving those problems. But I also think it's important to have voices and, and uh, people who kind of have their head in the pure idealism of like what we can build. Um, and from my perspective, like what I've really realized in talking a lot about my fans, especially on Discord, about what they value and how they value it is like the masses do not value um, digital assets. They do not value the MP3. We are in a full digital consumption culture where um, you're not going to be it, this idea that we're going to raise the price of a stream beyond 0 0.004 cents, I don't believe is ever going to happen. Um, and so as artists, I think it's our job to figure out, okay, well, what do fans value? Because we know that on the flip side, um, people who are lovers and consumers of art, they do wanna support the artists, but we need to find new ways in which for them to support. Um, and I'll be honest, my fans aren't in crypto. I have very, I have like probably five fans that are participating within these things and everything else, whether it's speculative, whether it's, you know, fans that I've made within the crypto space. Um, but until I'm able to issue NFTs with a fiat option and a credit card onboarding ramp um, and giving my fans the experience of owning a digital asset and having them internalize that, um, they're, they're not coming over. And they're pretty kind of vocal about that in a way. Um, and there's a lot of critique on my Discord on the environmental issues, on the idea, you know, the commodification of art um, et cetera. And so I think engaging one-on-one -on -one with your community is the most important and recognizing that like anything worth doing is going to be really difficult, right? Anything worth building is, is going to be a long process. And I think right now, you know, speaking to the quote unquote bubble, it's like, we've just weeded out so many people who were in it for a quick cash grab. And then, you know, now that it's becoming a bit difficult and we have to build from the ground up or, or exiting the systems, which I think is a great opportunity for the people who can envision a, a better and more equitable future for artists, for musicians, for the music industry to spend a lot of time building those systems. But I, I think that we're, there's so many issues, right? And, and I'm really interested in the idea of marketplace oversaturation being a huge factor into, uh, you know, why the, in, into the devaluation of music in general. It's it, when essentially the creation and distribution of music is now fully democratized. Um, and so we do need to add these additional value layers, whether it be membership to a community um, and, and providing people with an experience that's bigger than clicking on something and listening to it. Certainly. Yeah. I'm really interested that you, I'm, um, I'm interested in this like turn of phrase, um, like the devaluing of music, because like, I think that that's totally um, like linked to it's like commodity status, but I would argue that like in the last few years, actually like the value of music in terms of it's like social and psychological elements has probably only um, gone up or like the visibility of that value has only gone up. Um, and I'm really interested in the ways, I mean, I think I kind of already said this, but like that NFTs and web three can uh, sort of like enable that other value, like ena enable value outside of um financialization and Zola Jesus, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about that, because I think that that maybe is where your disillusionment sort of what you, what you said, where that kind of lies, um, because it sounds like you were pretty disenchanted with the financialization of it. And, yeah. but, but it's, it, it still sounds like you're kind of like hopeful about the space and, you know, you're participating in this conversation. So, um, I'm interested to know wh why. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've been trying to figure out how to like adequately 
put my disillusionment in the crypto space into words without being denigrating or anything. But I do feel like there's an aspect of it that like the DIO aspect is basic to me feels basically like a corporation and that you become just a stock and you know you're being traded and your currency can go up or down and it doesn't make me feel any more hopeful or any more accepted than the current sort of capitalist framework that music is put within and so that i have issues with i also feel like the crypto space is currently being gatekept by the people that have helped establish it I've noticed the decentralized marketing tactics within even the independent music NFT space. Um, people, artists or musicians selling NFTs and then people within the community are buying them as a means of, you know, pushing the narrative that this could be a future for the headline. I've seen that happen just with my with my peers. Um, and that makes me feel less sort of like. I feel like there's less honesty about whether or not this is something that could actually work because now I can't really trust the motives of the people that are sometimes behind the technology because it seems like they have their own agendas. Um, and that makes me feel, yeah, just a little uh, suspicious. But then on top of it, yeah, I just, I have a Patreon, I like that. I don't like asking my fans for money. I don't like that situation, but you know, I do feel supported, but I feel supported in a way that breeds charity and that breeds compassion and um, community. But if I were to insert myself into the current blockchain ledger, I feel like it's all about transaction and about currency and about ownership owning the person, owning the music, owning the artist, owning the art. And that's something that I don't want to feel like I have to negotiate with my fans. You know, they're already sometimes will say, oh, I wish you would make this kind of music or that kind of music, but now they feel like they have a stake in it. And then they're, you know, feeling sort of like they have some sort of authority over what kind of music I make or what directions I take as an artist. So I'm a little bit more punk in that way where I don't want to feel like that level of like financial tether to a fan base. And I don't want it, like I said, become a stock. Um, so just like the, just the nature of how blockchain is just about like an, a, uh, it's like a, just a technological structure that builds contracts and, and negotiations with people, uh, that feels to me like less human sometimes and more like more distrustful of, of like human compassion and the exchange of art and the people that, uh, that love it, you know? Um, I just, I don't wanna feel like I'm getting further embedded into a financial structure that is going to only um, limit or uh, suppress wherever I want to take my art and my passion. And that's been my biggest concern. And then just like the, the idea of speculative ownership of my work, I find offensive, you know, because it's something that I do take very personally. So I guess that's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a hard thing because I do think there's a lot of really good things about blockchain and crypto and Web3. And I think it could be a really beautiful space, but I want, I want it to be handled in, a, in as trans, in a transparent way where I feel like there isn't a lot of, even though it is a transparent technology, I feel like a lot of the, the stuff about it right now is not addressing kind of like that we're just further embedding ourselves into financial uh, agreements with people, which just to me feels like not punk. <laughs> yeah. It's like, not, not cool. It's not cool to me, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe Mikhail, do you sort of have anything to say about that in terms of like about the technology specifically and sort of how you've seen, how do you like speak to artists about um, sort of like mitigating that um, sort of like financial entrenchment, entrenchment? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, I completely, I completely agree. For me, a future in which every interaction between audiences and musicians is one of trans one of a financial transaction you know, nature is dystopian to me because it would basically take a lot of the arbitrarily like the val so basically you know when i was speaking about like kind of deconstructing the design language you know whereas in web 2 we had arbitrary set value which was likes you know follows that kind of stuff you know this is kind of arbitrary but it signifies value you know and web 3 kind of took the toxicity of that and made it kind of worse through attaching the monetary values right in the corner of the asset, you know? So um, this is something that 
that shows a mismatch of what people who design the technology think is relevant and what actually is relevant. The same thing is, of course, in how um, a lot of the space that designs those technologies, you know, assumes their relationship, the relationship between fans and artists. Are. You know, I've been now obsessed with music for um, 12, you know, like since I'm 12 years old, let's say 25 years. And I have never wanted that my money does more to an artist, but that they dance for me when I paid for and they go happy, you know, and home and buy themselves a good meal from the money I contributed their their career. But if your reality is staring on crypto charts all day, you might think that my relationship to artists is also one of the investor. 99% of the audiences don't want to handle cultural investment portfolios tracking, which little blockchain track is now the hottest that might, you know, create revenue for them if they sell the fractional share. This is not the way we engage with culture. So, but the more, and um, I think uh, Chloe said something really important. Um, one thing that also now scales differently with that many artists coming into Web3 is accountability. You know, we've seen now, and this is a topic that has been, you know, uh, already brought up a few times. Uh, blockchain existed for 15 years, Ethereum existed for 10 years. Not much has been happening, or even though everybody knew that this is a big issue now that artists come into the space, all of a sudden conversations, actions, changes, initiatives, bounties, you know, green NFTs uh, initiatives all happening because artists and the communities that come of artists, responsibility scales completely different with those communities. And also the tools that are going to be built will be built from other perspectives, centering other usabilities quite soon. So right now we're still in an experimentation layer where the intentions and the use cases don't quite match, but slowly, you know, they rub against each other and rub off all the things that don't match. And in the end, I think the future of NFTs and all of this technology is not the $1,000 collectible, but the frictionless, um, frictionless, free um, social signaling, you know? So a lot of those things, because ultimately the, the, the chance of this is not, you know, find a new way to sell shit to your audiences, is, but to own the relationship to your audience because for the last 15 years, we did not own any of those relationships. You can't export your Instagram follows to a new project, but you can do that with the relationships that you own, that you build through Web3. So a lot of that selling assets is the alpha stage of all of this. And don't really forget, we are like, this has literally started for 99% of the people January 15th, 2021. You know, how much can you? design and frictionless UX experiences in such a short amount of time, you know, but we, that's our expectation because when we adapted, you know, Spotify, for example, what we did was a trade-off. We got, got convenience versus, you know, we traded convenience versus agency. You know, we don't have agencies, audiences, we don't have agencies, artists, but for that, we have this really integrated, convenient ecosystem of tools that, you know, allow you to access all of the music. Bandcamp is a step out of that convenience because it's shitty to use, you know, it's more expensive. But stepping back from the convenience adds more value to the creator, which is why a lot of people use Bandcamp because they know of my $10, more of that will arrive with the artists. And that kind, that negotiation of those things happens right now um, as the tools are being built out and they're not being built out in the sell your digital asset for a lot of money part of NFTs. No, no, not at all. They're more uh, built out in the communal, you know, inclusive collaborative into op, like uh, interdependent part of, of Web3. Yeah, certainly. Um, Matt, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. I mean, first to go right, right back to the kind of on-chain, off-chain stuff. Um, I think it's also telling of kind of like the distorted narrative that we've, we've been approached on this, like the week that uh, uh, Beeple sold the 69 million, whatever image uh, at Christie's, um, Aaron Wright and the team at Open Law passed legislation in Wyoming that basically legally uh, gave some legal recognition to DAOs. Why that's important is because when we talk about any asset that an LLC um, uh, can own, with, whether it be media rights, whether it be any form of property, um, that is kind of the bridge. And so, yeah, so in terms of like, uh, in terms of in terms of these these kind of like what seemingly are kind of like immaterial or like kind of hazy things around copyright or ownership, um, that's that's going to be changed really really quickly. Um, and then to speak to a lot of Nika's points, I mean, both the scenarios that you raised there, I think, are very plausible. Um, 
it kind of to go back to my initial point it's like the 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 bargain that you make entering into the space is that the bad things will happen right you are going to see um someone in the comments mentioned like a maroon five dow um i don't know maroon five personally but <laughs> but i do expect that you will see you will see dystopian scenarios where you know people are using dow structures or token structures to raise a lot of money um set kind of ridiculous expectations about like participating in things um and ultimately uh kind of uh Trying to trying to push people toward, um, you know, seeing their art practice as this kind of speculative financial vehicle. Um, the one thing I would say on that is that you know there is nothing inherent to these tools, irrespective of the fact that you can go out and find a gajillion examples of people wanting to 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 uh, to use them in such way. There's nothing inherent to these tools um, to to force you to. Uh, to see yourself as that financial vehicle, right? Like um, I'm currently working on a DAO at the moment and you can't get access, right? Like you have to be given access. And one of the conditions of that access, not dissimilar to maybe a Patreon, right? You could have a similar dynamic with a Patreon where you say, okay, give me a bunch of money. And then you can kind of, you have some kind of say in the practice. Um, it's all about setting expectations and saying, well, actually no, like maybe there's, you know, there's some kind of vehicle or some kind of uh, a method by which you can involve more people into practice. And the only condition being that you have complete control over, over what you do. Because if, some, if, somebody, if somebody enters into that, expecting a short financial return or expecting to push you to, you know, uh, I use the analogy of like getting Radiohead to re-record a creep or something like this, you know, um, clearly they're not the fan that you want involved and you don't give them access. That, that's not what, they, that's not what it's, it's designed for. And so, uh, the other thing I will say on top of this is that, and I, th I do think it's daunting, but I think ultimately it's kind of a good pulling of the Band-Aid in some ways, is that one of the most kind of arresting and frightening things about this that I also have a great deal of hesitation about is that all this financial stuff is out in public, right? It's guts and all. It's it's shocking. Um, now, my con uh, contention there at least would be to say, I don't think that's a crypto problem. I don't think crypto is creating financialization around culture. I don't think crypto is creating ridiculous valuations over pieces of artwork. I think crypto is putting it on chain and making those visible. And I think that ultimately it's net positive that we might be able to develop some fluency as to how culture is currently working, how culture is currently traded, what most people, you know, in who I might disagree with, um, see culture as, as a vehicle of kind of, you know, social capital or, or, or just, just capital C capital. Um, but in my mind, I think long-term that is a net positive. It's a net positive that people uh, uh, initially are shocked by that and then come to think, okay, well now I have more of a fluency of how these things are already being, uh, being dealt with. What might be the protocol that we as an individual or as a community or as a label or as a magazine or whatever, what's the protocol that we want to put in place? That to me is, 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 is a net positive moving away from kind of like extremes of like utopias, dystopias. These are easy to, to, to imagine. It's going to be somewhere in the middle and it's going to be lots of different stuff. And, and the one thing I think we all probably agree on, but for maybe those listening um, where NFTs and Web3 is kind of presented oftentimes as kind of like a fad, uh, this is not a fad. Like this is something we should have been talking about two years ago. This is happening. Um, uh, and so, you know, guts and all as gross as, as some of the stuff is having a negative reaction to it to go back to uh, to Claire's point earlier right having a negative reaction to it I think is good right because ultimately that will push us um, toward thinking about uh, what we might want to see and I might add that advantage that um, that opportunity of being able to think about what we want outside of central control of a Spotify or a Google or a Facebook that is the the point like that like that is the opportunity here uh, uh, warts and all so yeah I'm gonna shut up now yeah, I think uh, quickly to like add on to that, it's really interesting that it, you know, it took what, 10 years for the like mainstream to be critical of Spotify and it took three months for the mainstream media to be critical of NFTs. So I think, yeah, in a way, this criticism is is good because it's getting things like out in the open. And Chloe, like you said earlier, like criticism is care. Um, and I see you have your hand raised and, uh, but I did just want to quickly uh, like go back to that comment about the Maroon 5 DAO um, because I know we, we haven't really talked about like what a DAO is um, and maybe Chloe, um, you could uh, sort of elaborate and say what you wanted to say, but also speak a little bit to like what, what a DAO is. I would give it a shot, but um, one of the points, and actually this does relate to this. So 
Um, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And so essentially it is you create um, what it's going to be outline. Um, I'm trying to think of the word that we've been using this whole time, your protocols. And as like this company or this platform or this currency that you've created, um, however we want to describe it, um, as members of it and it grows, um, if people begin to disagree with the direction that it's taking, you can always like fork off the chain and go somewhere else. Um, so it is autonomous from others. Um, obviously, it's influenced by general themes usually that are going on right now, specifically um, in like the marketplace, <laughs> air quotes of like the web 3.0 space. <laughs> um but ultimately um at every point in your decentralized um autonomous organization um it's sort of like having a board per se but everyone who's invested in it is in fact the board and so everyone's a participant rather than like a hierarchical thing um and then when people disagree they can split off and go their own ways or um stick with one side of it um i think actually a really great notion of this um that I'm mean, not great actually, but like an example of something that you can really easily find in like even Coinbase or something like that. One of the more intro wallets is Ethereum Classic, where people got angry about the fork to solve some issue and did this whole thing and it's like threatening to the space, but like it still exists and it's not like it's gotten wiped out. Um, it's all there's all this like weirdness and drama around that existing, but it's there and they're like, this is our stake. <laughs> like they're willing to be on that hill over there. Um, so hopefully that helps distinguish kind of in a casual manner um, what a um, what a DAO is. And then I'm thinking about this also in relationship to um, the trending word interdependence, which I know that like the podcast that's primarily around this stuff is called interdependence. People tend to use that word in, um, I didn't say CEO. Yeah, it's like everybody. No, but, sorry, I was, um, I was responding, I was responding, Nick, yeah, Nick posted the question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. So it's like a, a collective um, versus, yeah, like a collective board decisioning or bargaining with each other versus like one person and then the board existing over top of them. Um, but um, I'm thinking a lot about like a healthy interdependent relationship between people is often like defined as like um, distinguishing between the needs of partners um, and helping to meet the need of each partner in a meaningful and supportive way. Um, and then like both partners, I guess, make effort to support each other's needs and don't control each other or demand. And so that's like a healthy interdependent relationship. And I feel like this tends to get like also brought into this like idealized or utopic view of the web 3.0 space. And it kind of goes toward what Nika was saying in that point of people trying to have ownership over your work. That's like not actually interdependence. And so it's sort of like the dialogue that we tend to have as artists and around this space, like the potentialities aren't outlined with protocols that, and even if they were, people might not listen, you know, like ultimately that I guess is the gamble, but it's also like, in thinking about these futures and in creating more like decentralized autonomous um, organizations like is there a way to create protocol around like how we want people to interact with us as artists and how we want our art to not be objectified but to be supported and engaged with in a caring way like i i don't i don't like doing live streams like i'm a computer musician like you want to see me with the midi controller like it's boring um, like I can make a max patch do that for itself, like based on timing. And so like during um, this whole like live streaming time um, to keep my contracts, I, I built these like interactive um, live stream tools where people could go to a website and play with sliders and the stream would come back with like their interactions with my work and I'd collaborate with visual artists and such. Um, and that's like how I chose to navigate that space and like, I'm thinking a lot about how we can continue to make these choices as individuals, but like the more that we can discuss our protocols and our wants to make different interactive choices, the more that like 
we can maybe get together and it's not just about me or you. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Nika, do you feel like your your question was answered there? I feel like there's a lot going on in the in the chat now. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the thing that really intrigues me about Web3 is the potential to create communities that can kind of, you know, be supportive of art or music in my case. Um, but I do see it kind of just as like another corporation, as another financial sort of like agreement or pact with people. And um, I understand that it's all protocol and protocol can be whatever, but you know, this is how I'm seeing it be established. And so I'm just kind of concerned, like, is that kind of, is the technology going to develop in a way that just cur that just further um, enmeshes us in financial contracts with people? Because that kind of makes me feel creeped out sometimes, but I do think that the protocol can do a lot of great things in building and sustaining communities and creating communities, international communities of things. And, you know, the, the possibilities are endless and that's really awesome and exciting to me, but I just don't like the crypto bro, like let's make this just like our version of libertarian corporations kind of vibe like that. Got to convince me that that's not going to be the future because otherwise I'm going to be really critical. <laughs> Yeah, I feel yeah. the exact same skepticism and stuff. Some stuff yeah. I just like can't read or listen to. Um, although I'm trying to like be as accommodating to all voices in like in in shaping my own knowledge. Um, but Sherry and Kelsey, I see you both have your hands raised. Sherry, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this I I'm really glad people are asking about. Um, yeah, a lot of like good questions about DAOs in the chat. I guess I yeah, both of my um, comments are about. DAOs in relation to the chat and also this conversation. Um, I guess first to address uh, Nika, I think you had asked the question about, um, yeah, like are the major shareholders in a DAO equivalent to, to the CEO? Something that I also have like only learned recently and um, I don't think it's super common, but it is something to look out for is um, like certain blockchains um, that, you know, or like certain tokens. There definitely are a lot of like token or blockchain types out there where a small handful of people do own the majority of the supply and there are people like looking into this and like publishing data about it, which is great. But like, yeah, like where like 60, like 50 to 60% are held just by um, the team of like five people or like just by the investors versus the majority being held by the community. Um, yeah, this, this is a great example of, um, I think to what Matt was talking about earlier to like, to this data, um, definitely being like uh, relatively easier to find because it is more decentralized. Um, so that's definitely, yeah, something to look out to. Definitely for sure possible to create a DAO that has a semblance of, uh, you know, community, but actually, you know, one or two people hold the, hold the majority of like uh, the, the tokens or voting power. So definitely something to look out for there. Um, two, uh, I was just looking into this Maroon 5 DAO, which like, yes, just that phrase in and of itself is like very dystopian. That said, at least according to their page, um, it's I think it's structured as a charitable DAO. So I think once you own um, this NFT uh, or like one of like you know the series of NFTs, um, you are part of this DAO where you can vote on where all the proceeds from the NFTs will go to in terms of like you know charitable causes. I think this DAO in particular is focused on um, like environmental concerns and, and climate change. Um, so I think that in concept. Um, is, is really interesting and could be really good um, application of crypto and DAOs in a way that isn't just, you know, uh, go into this DAO so you can decide on, you know, what kind of songs Baroon 5 um, records next. Um, I have seen instances of other DAOs where um, it's like a community, like fund for, uh, for like small businesses, you know, like once you're part of this DAO, you can vote on, you know, like who we should give uh, grants to for like early businesses to hit the ground running. Um, I think that WC is applying to, you know, like artist um, grant funds as well. So uh, yeah, so they are, I think, uh, relatively, I think like few and far between for now, but they do exist. And yeah, definitely encourage people to, to look more to those applications for DAOs as opposed to, yeah, the very like, uh, I guess, individual list creator economy type, like join, you know, my branded artist DAO so you can help uh, just me and my group. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Kelsey, do you, you still have your hand up? <laughs> Feels yeah. like a class or something. Everyone with their no, hand up. This this kind of goes back to to what Matt said earlier that 
decentralization it can be great in its best iteration and then it can be the worst in its worst iteration and i think that DAOs are, are very similar it's like, and it comes down to the ethos of the community and so it's it's what are you what is your protocol and and what kind of community are you trying to build and i think from my perspective the i right fans invest in me as an artist all of the time, whether it's in the music, whether it's coming to tour, whether it's buying merch, whether, you know, in all of these various ways. And so the idea, um, and, and all of my communities are non-gated, like access to me is probably way too open at this point. I talk to everyone um, that I possibly can. So the idea that if, if I built a community with these uh, this group of fans that are the diehard first to arrive, con actively contributing to the community and allowing there to be an upside to, to their participation within the community. That's how I view that, um, where if you're putting $50 to become a member, that's just a random number, to become a member of this community, whatever it might mean, or buying X amount of tokens or probably being gifted them, that there's an incentive for you to continue to participate and become a meaningful member of that community, which raises the overall value of that community. And it's actually really easy to then weed out bad actors, because if you're just buying that as a speculative thing, right, you're not going to probably demonstrate value into that community because that takes a lot of heart and a lot of um, like time and effort. Um, and I think looking at what Audius is doing with their social token um, is actually a really good example of this is how much audio you get is dependent on what you are providing to the overall community. And I think that that it, I think if you go into it with that mentality, it's it's really kind of easy to see. Okay, if you're buying this as a, as, as a speculative uh, investment, I a that doesn't totally bother me because I think that people can do with their money what they please. But I don't think that they're going to get as much out of it as the idea of I'm a an active member of this community and you know therefore I. Verite, I'm going to show up and play a show in your driveway for you, right? This idea that um, you're building something that's greater than the artist and ideally detached from me, right? It's my discord exists without me. I've created a community of people who um, like hang out and entertain themselves when I go away for a month, right? And so I think that becomes the goal so that the community isn't fully dependent on me as this, this pillar in this center, but you're building something where that has a, a greater meaning. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it for sure. Um, so I know we said we were going to wrap up around now, but do folks have time to stay? There's some uh, questions that have popped up in the chat and in the discord. If anyone has to go, um, feel free to, uh, sign off. Um, but here is one from Jesse. If you could speculate, what do you think might be some of the events or attitudes that shift this skeuomorphic mapping of the logic of the contemporary art market? Wealthy collectors speculating on opaquely priced assets as thinly veiled money and reputation laundering onto this most recent NFT bubble so that more career viable and sustainable support mechanisms become more culturally mainstream. Um, I, I, it's in the chat, but does anyone want to have a take a stab at that? I have to look up the definition of skeuomorphism. <laughs> skeuomorphism, <laughs> skeuomorphism is just like a um, an abstract representation of something kind of real. So I mean, like, so like Second Life would be considered skeuomorphic because it's kind of trying to represent real physical interactions between people. Um, Yeah, so I guess sort of like the heart of the question is like, what are the things that maybe need to happen to shift us away from this like auctiony people? Um, it's already happening. I, I think I think it's a it, it's already happening. It's kind of a narrative failure of the space generally that most people who are working on things that are going to look dramatically different from how. Uh, the music economy worked or the art economy worked or just kind of busy working on that stuff. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the narrative got hijacked by by a media and and some actors in the space um, uh, 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 to kind of suggest that the only thing that's happening at the moment is this kind of auction uh, mentality. But but to my to my knowledge, this is really like a, a historical blip, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the 
the diversity of applications is 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 in is in process um and if anything it's just kind of incumbent on us to to bring our imagination to the process um and contribute to that because for most people in my experience at least when most people think about music now particularly most people like under 30 they just think about streaming right when most people over 30 think about music they have other associations with it um the the, the most important i think an urgent thing is for clever and smart and invested and and you know people involved in, in music communities to, to develop some fluency on the space and then think about what they would like their music economy to look like that's the real opportunity um and the bad stuff is going to happen too you know but that's just going to happen anyway that's just like a um yeah so 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 i would say in a sense that the the, the characterization um the characterization is accurate in one respect but it's not um you know uh, most people i know who are working on this stuff are, are, are certainly not limiting their their vision of art to uh you know to 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 resembling like christie's christie's with with a wallet with a web wallet or something I, that, that that's not gonna yeah you know, that will happen but there's other stuff happening <laughs> yeah um this one from alex interested to hear everyone's thoughts on how diy labels can function in a web3 environment in particular how can a label retain its artistic and curatorial identity if operating as a DAO or using a show social token are there any examples of this working in the context of experimental music um i'll jump in quickly here um because i wanted to talk about this and there just hasn't been time but the uh akisa project um and matt i know you and holly had uh one of the uh, folks from there on the podcast recently but it's like this amazing um like decentralized music project that uh ended up being released on like 40 different labels in 20 different countries um and they really uh sort of gave up the, their, their like control to get more power over the release, um, which I thought, I think that was actually something Holly said on the podcast and I was like, whoa. Um, but uh, yeah, does anybody else want to maybe talk more specifically about that? I'll put a link to the um, Akisa project in the chat as well. I mean, ultimately this is what I said initially, even though the Akisa, that's the Sinyava album, right? Uh, so even though that used all the promises that DAOs and Web3 kind of makes, but used it in a very analog and very still traditional way. But it uh, drives the point home that I was also earlier saying that in the value creation of grassroots and underground and independent music culture, the distinction between, you know, who's the consumer, who is the marketing person is very often very blurred. You know, it's um, one of the things that I've been always saying, you know, for example, that word promoter, when you talk about parties, you always talk about a promoter. In 99% of the cases, that promoter is not a promoter. It's like somebody who's so engaged with the music community that put their own money into populating the culture. My first parties were exclusively financed by the German government's student funding because that was my only income. I was pumping that into break corp parties, you know, and there was no financial gain for me. Um, I know Zola, you worked with Sanopticon, one of the artists from that time that I, that I incredibly loved and that I loved seeing working with you, by the way. Completely unrelated footnote. But um, so we negotiating that power relations between, you know, what audiences contribute, what individual festivals or cultural institutions contribute, you know, where you really can't say, uh, where, where it's not as clear cut with mainstream's label, you know, this is our big mountain music product, we know we'll do so much in streaming. So renegotiating those power relationships um, will be the path forward. What we've seen right now is that the one functional usable use case of that technology, which is selling assets to the highest price, price possible was, was, was appropriated and used, but that's not the only use case. So I think patience and the more artists will know about the possibilities they have, the more they will make those possibilities so embed them into their artistic practice. And for that, they don't have quite enough the tools and the information yet, but it changes. So again, this is this is rich people reproducing what rich people know. And there's a different element to now actually communities using those tools for different ways of constituting themselves. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I totally uh, agree with like all of that. Um, another question from Tanis. Uh, I'm curious to know where everyone sees the NFT space falling in relation to the platform capitalist model of the streaming services we're pushing back against for the sake of 
artist rights? Can it be a solution to it or can they only exist in entirely separate realms? Um, I think like Audius is probably the best example of like the sort of like co co meshing of the two ideas like of web three and uh, of, uh, of, of sort of your traditional streaming. Um, but does anyone else have thoughts on that? I think they have to exist um, as two separate silos at the moment um, and, until everything can be streamlined under one beautifully uh, structured blockchain umbrella where royalty payments are being paid directly out to Spotify, et cetera. But like, so long as you have a fiat system and a blockchain system, I, I don't really believe that you're going to be able to fully mesh them. And so I think that they should be viewed as two completely different paths that one, you know, as a musician walks simultaneously, you're playing two different games in my mind. Yeah, um, uh, oh. yeah sure, oh. I see your uh, hands raised. Sorry, yeah, just, I guess one thing to add to that. Um, I, so actually I'll, I'll um, yeah, I'll address this with some like an article that I'm actually currently working on that is outside of NFTs, but related to this question. It's about um, the growing number of music companies who are experimenting with um, converting select artists uh, royalties and opt-in basis into crypto. So I know um, Prescription Songs is working on this publishing company, Alpha Pup, the distribution um, label services company is working on this. As an artist, you can opt into this like beta tests where, yeah, you can like opt to get all or a certain portion of your royalties converted to a cryptocurrency of your choice. Um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, initiative to like, as an easier way to get artists who are able to, you know, more involved in crypto to get them even, you know, able to participate in the crypto economy in the first place. That said, to tie now back to this question, I think um, what it's like still feels like strange about it is that you're getting you are getting paid in crypto, but um, it's still tied to consumption. And I think like the streaming, the dominant like, you know, streaming platforms, they incentivize like repeat consumption, repeat listening. Um, and there's been like a, a, yeah, a lot of, there have been a lot of other really great discussions about how, of course that doesn't, um, that like rewards certain artists, it certainly does not reward other kinds of artists, especially, you know, those in say classical jazz or like more experimental um, music genres. And whereas like NFTs, the way that artists are being compensated in, in that world right now, um, arguably is not tied to consumption at all. I think, yeah, actually someone found on Catalog, this um, uh, music platform powered by Zora, uh, music NFT platform, there's no correlation between say an artist's social media presence and um, the amount that they're generating from NFT sales, uh, which I think is really great. It, you know, it creates more opportunities for artists who may otherwise get overlooked. So. So yeah, so I definitely see there could be a connection somehow to um, what, what Kelsey was talking about, but it's just, yeah, for now, it's just the, the whole point is that it is a fundamentally different way of working such that you don't, your compensation does not only have to be tied to repeat consumption, you know, the largest share of like the, the stream pie from, from Spotify, for example. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting to think about those two things, and um, I actually the the sort of um, first companies you were talking about I hadn't heard of, um, but they sound interesting. Um, uh, I'm thinking there's two questions here that are kind of related and might be like a nice way to end things. Uh, someone asks, "What does it mean to be a meaningful member of a?" community of an artist. Um, and the other one is as artists, are you meaningful members of other artists communities? I guess this sort of like meaningful members thing, because I guess I think, again, it's so important to like have these like big, huge conversations, but I think it's also really important to like tie it back to like, why are we all here and talking about this in the first place? Because we like really care about music, <laughs> um, at least like in this, in this discussion. And so I'd love to sort of hear everyone's thoughts on like, what does it mean to be like a meaningful member of an artist community? And, and are, can you sort of provide an example of a, of a community that you're part of? And then I think we will leave it at that. I can start and then pass it off. Um, I think that within my community, which I've really spent the last year um, really intentionally building out, obviously, because we were all stuck inside for a year. Um, for me, it's, it's, 
its presence. Like we, there were always communities, right? It's like this old idea of a street team, right? Where kids would volunteer to go put posters up and spray paint the sidewalk, et cetera. But now all of that exists in a digital landscape. And so obviously it's going to look different. And so I view this as a symbiotic relationship where for my community, I'm very active in asking what do you guys want? What do you value? Um, right, Get, gathering opinions um, and, and allowing the people who support me to feel seen and to feel like they're participating in something that's greater than them. And then in return, you know, there's all of these like little fun initiatives that we do. You know, I play Among Us on Discord with my fans all the time. Um, I do live cooking shows where I burn shit in my kitchen and they laugh at me. Um, and then, you know, there was a, a thousand stream initiative for, you know, my latest single by now where essentially fans were like, you know, listening to the song, sharing the song. And once they hit a thousand streams, I sent them a personal letter. Right. And so I think presence and, and, and what it looks like to be a valuable member to a community looks different for each individual community. Um, but I think it's about communication and then showing up for each other. So it's not only fans showing up for an artist, it's an artist also showing up for their fans. Um, and in terms of like my participation in other artists' communities, if I'm being completely honest, I don't have time to have that presence within any other artist community. Like I barely have time to do it in the way that I'm doing it with mine, but like I am on the Audius uh, grants committee, for instance. And so I think from my perspective, like one-on-one -on -one with other artists, I talk about this shit all, all the time. Um, but also being realistic where, you know, I want to make sure that when I make a commitment to be a part of something like that committee that I have the time and bandwidth to do a very good job at it, if, if all of that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, Nika, maybe you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, so, hmm. Well, I, I have been running a Patreon for a couple years now, and that's really changed the way that I think about my community, that I have one. I didn't think I had one before that. I thought I was just swimming alone in a sea of competition and, you know, market performance and stuff like that. But then when I found out that there were people that were willing to sustain my creative process and my life, um, that was really energizing and inspiring to me. And it made me think about what I provide for them. And um you know, more than, uh, I don't know that I think about, you know, how, how we sustain each other, but I think that's just like an innate part of having a Patreon, you know, um, providing people with things that, that give them care and comfort. And, and um, that's what music is supposed to do for people, you know, it's supposed to be a balm or whatever, it can be anything. But, um, and then in terms of, I also support other people's Patreons and, you know, would they have a DAO or something? I would do that as well. Um, and I, I am a part of other DAOs as well. Uh, but um, for me, it's just about being part of community and that community, it, it extends past what I do as a musician. It, it encompasses other music, other people, my friends, family, the people that I care about. And, um, and that community is, is like a broader framework that I think we all operate in. But that's what's important to me is, uh, you know, the Dryhurst interdependence vibe, I think is really, it's a really beautiful idea of, you know, showing up for other artists as much as you show up for yourself and, you know, really seeing us all a part of one ecosystem. And so I do that by trying to support other artists and their Patreons and their communities as much as possible. If I see that they're a part of, you know, something that I believe in as well and that I get something out of because I'm also a fan as much as I'm an artist, I'm a fan. And, um, and I see just how, how, uh, how when you are a part of something that does feel like a community, how much more grounded you feel in such a decentralized world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when everything, everything feels like relationships feel more fragmented, especially through COVID. And, and it's hard to know like where, you know, how you can connect or communicate with other people and where you stand with them. But being a part of these communities helps me to uh, feel like there is a, a true ecosystem that we're all a part of. So that's, that's, uh, that's my vibe. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Full uh, <laughs> shout out to the Interdependence podcast. I imagine most people yeah, watching right now uh, 
have listened to it. I also wanted to shout out uh, Verite has an amazing podcast called An Anatomy Anatomy of an Artist um, that I've been digging into uh, and really been enjoying that. Um, but Chloe, maybe you want to like talk about what it means to be a meaningful uh, member of a, an artist community. Yeah, um, I think my perspective is slightly different because like while I am a musician and I collaborate with musicians and I do record, um, I primarily approach the space as a sound artist. And so most of my funding comes from um, like essentially like a gallery will pay to fly me somewhere and pay me for my work. I've also worked as an arts administrator. Um, I've also ran project spaces that I funded from working a day job in tech. And I've promoted shows, thrown raves, um, done a bunch of different things, and then do sound design for other people and myself and build things, and then also run a max meetup <laughs> um, for that and do some instructional video stuff for cycling and other sort of forms of teaching for other artists and also people who are newer to making music and art. And so like, I'm kind of always interacting with different people and I'm also part of a studio space where Nika, I know you were last week. Um, and so I work with like other artists and engineers all the time. And I don't really actually spend a lot of time like asking for direct support from my like fan base or my audience. And oftentimes I'll redirect that support to causes. And so like specifically like the trial around the tar sands that's happening in my nation right now. Um, things with like Palestine awareness, like stuff that's happening in the world. Like I tend to like redirect funding there because at this point, like as I get to fit in this more gallery context, like I'm pretty well funded. Um, not I'm not well funded, but like <laughs> I'm releasing an album that's like a game and we'll monetize that in some ways, but I don't feel the need to do a Patreon at this point because I still do day job work. Um, and I have a lot of skills and I do work a lot and also make art a lot. So that's like my community is like people I interact with and know from shows and collaborate with. And I'm generally trying to find ways to like share information and tools and ways that we can all help each other like expand our praxis, praxis um, both like morally or like ethically and also like through actually the tools and stuff that we make and the sounds we make as musicians. Um, so yeah, I interact with people in a lot of different ways and my notions of community are also probably a little bit different um, and my notions of reciprocity just given like my own background. Nice one. Um, Mikhail, I know you have to head out, but uh, if you have time to uh, answer the question about uh, what it means to be a meaningful member of the artist community and any sort of uh, last words. Um, yes, I do have an opinion on that, surprisingly. Uh, well, I mean, one of the things, you know, that started immediately with the, the kind of all of this happening was that um, a few people that you know happen to work with a lot at, at the very beginning of this NFT craze, we identified that there's you know, and it, everyone here in this group will be able to 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 confirm that if you're part of an artistic community, if you're part of a community, there's way more to it than sharing marketing support for each other. You know, this is not just you know hyping each other up on twitter being part of a community is being part of a community of care which means sharing infrastructures sharing resources even you know uh psych psychosocial care you know this is this is this is something that is incredibly important so one of the very first thing we did before most of the nft craze happened before people before all of that you know we started an organization called mint fund which basically does exactly that. It tries to create a digital community of care that enables, that centers voices that in the current conversations are not centers, bring those voices to the table and also extends, you know, the resources, like that understanding of a real life community, the resources and access to, to, to infrastructure. We do that through providing, you know, funds for artists to access this, you know, education support and so on. So I think what I'm trying to say is being 
a meaningful member of an artistic community is to act within that community as if it's a community of care that involves these elements, you know, um, infrastructure, resources, and and psychological care. And um, <clears throat> that I think many people now learn because you also should understand that many of the young artists that came into NFTs, they are very, very young. They do not know. I was actually yesterday watching a, a video on Napster. You know, what happened to the people that got sued by the RAAA for 200 million? You know, realizing that that story that comes naturally to me because, you know, this is, I'm that old. 90% of the kids that I deal with at my day job, which is Zora, were born after all of this happened. You know, they didn't even come to, to, to maturation intellectually. They were born after this happened, which means that a lot of those kids come with not much context. They've never been part of an artistic community. They've never been part of, you know, experiencing art that happens in squats versus spaces run by brands, you know, such experiences have been also disrupted by one and a half years of pandemic. So kind of carry over those offline in real life ideas and structures on chain is something that is incredibly important and that I'm committed to. And with these warm words, I have to apologize to myself and say everyone, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Have all a wonderful day. And if you have questions, find me. Thanks, you know, Mikhail. Have a good evening, all. Yeah, I think I'll quickly sort of jump off the back of Mikhail's, uh, what, what he was saying there, but I'm really interested in like, I think we're all quick to use this language like um, online and then in real life. Like we say like, oh, it's so nice to meet you in real life or whatever, but like online is real life. Um, and like increasingly so, um, and this, this isn't, these aren't my words, but um, people, someone has sort of coined, the idea of instead of saying like in real life, saying like away from keyboard, like AFK, which was like an old sort of like I am slang thing, which like I absolutely love because it's like, I think saying like in real life or saying offline, it doesn't really make sense anymore because like online and offline are, are we ever really offline? I don't know. Um, and like, is, is our lives online any, or like our lives at the computer any less real than uh, our lives away from the computer? So anyway, just wanted to add that because I really love this like away from keyboard um, thing. Um, Matt, maybe you want to talk about uh, meaning, being a meaningful member of an artist community? Yeah, sure. Um, also, thanks for the kind words on the podcast and stuff that actually means a great deal. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, to speak to this kind of like IRL, URL thing, like if these tools don't make a material difference to people's real lives, then they're not worth a damn, period. Like the, I'm, I'm not a fetishist um, uh, in, in that respect. And that's kind of, kind of the point. Um, I think that like, to go back to the question earlier about streaming, right? Like one of the kind of impositions I think of streaming that, that I, I find quite like philistinic um, was this kind of idea that music is any one thing, you know, that you could produce a kind of one size fits all solution for a particular uh, a community. Of course, uh, of course, this is absurd. Like that, what we get closer to, I hope, um, with Web3, with the ability for people to develop their own uh, protocols or participate in, in, in other protocols is we get maybe a bit closer to the truth, which of course is the interdependency of things, right? Like one of the things that I, uh, that drives me nuts about the, the kind of, the historicizing around independent music is this conception that independent music was all about the individual. And, and to some extent that is true, right? Like to some extent, there were certain individuals that were afforded um, opportunities and distribution networks that, that they wouldn't have otherwise. But the big point is actually the kind of opportunities and distribution networks part, right? Like it put like envisage yourself, like put yourself in the 1980s, like before the internet, um, how much work it would have been um, to have created those distribution channels between these disparate communities all across the world, right? All across the world. How much work that would have been working with like dodgy physical infrastructure, like books, uh, you know, books and magazine articles. Um, all of that work made that moment possible. Um, and so for me, it's very difficult to disentangle, you know, the, the independent musical figure that, that people like to conveniently use, um, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's super difficult to disentangle them from, you know, those people who were running the venues, those promoters who were taking financial risk to, to do things, those people who were, you know, packing boxes, uh, designing the record sleeves. Um, so, so as, as jarring as it is in a sense to kind of, uh, uh, 
present all this stuff as, as, as openly as you can do when it, when it comes on chain. To me, what it represents to a certain degree is, is a degree of truth and complexity that, that is missing from like independent music narratives, right? Where, like, um, and so, yeah, so for me, I mean, my personal interest in, in music generally, I've been active in music for, for way, way longer than, than, than is comfortable. Um, my, my personal interest is uh, uh, in, in being part of, uh, part of communities that, to go back to Nika's like a, a earlier point and concern, which I think is a legitimate concern, um, you know, communities that support uh, artists unconditionally, communities that, um, that distribute funds to the people whose work uh, uh, contributed to producing that value, whether it be uh, a monetary value or, 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 or not. Um, and, and I do hope that I see more promise in these tools um, for kind of building out that infrastructure with a healthy amount of critique than I have seen in 10 years of kind of, you know, belly aching over, over streaming, which is one of my favorite, uh, my favorite kind of uh, dart boards. Um, and, and that's, and that's really encouraging, but, but yeah, so, 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 I mean, the, the most important part in a sense to go back to this decentralization point is that, you know, these tools represent kind of what you want them to. A lot of work needs to be done to establish fluency with people um, so that they can afford to have ideas about what, what, what they want to see. Um, the good news is that, uh, that I, I do actually believe that these tools will afford that ability for a very, very wide, uh, wide range of people. Um, the bad news is that as I kind of mentioned earlier, this is happening anyway. Um, and the one thing that kind of stresses me out a little bit is, you know, being my age, I hear about stories. It was a bit before my time, stories of kind of the music industry and music communities kind of aloofly dismissing the coming internet. Um, the, my biggest concern is that there's a, there is a climate at the moment of kind of oftentimes negativity, kind of stigmatization. My biggest concern is that we get ourselves into that position again, because uh, I really can't emphasize enough, this is happening, um, irrespective of whether we choose to uh, gain fluency about it and have these wonderful ideas about how it might apply to our communities or our practices, this is happening. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, the bad news is that, you know, uh, uh, the bad news is that we ought to have been having these conversations a few years ago. And, and I couldn't be more enthused that groups like this come together. Um, and, and all the people on this panel um, are, are thinking about it so, so, you know, so thoroughly um, uh, that because yeah, it, it's, it, it's happening and, and uh, it's kind of incumbent on us to, to make it not suck. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Uh, and I guess to sort of touch on something you said there that I didn't quite get to like ask formally, but I think like this word independent used to articulate something quite specific in, especially in terms of music. Um, and now I think I've seen like a lot of the people in this discussion specifically, but also in the wider music industry question, like, what does it mean to be independent anymore? And like that word doesn't really articulate uh, what what it means there's there, that idea is still there but I'm really like kind of turning over this idea of like is it interdependent is it decentralized like what what is like the new thing um and I'm really interested to see like where where that um discussion goes um but yeah Sherry do you want to wrap wrap this up <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've just been, yeah, listening and, and absorbing everything. This has been, um, yeah, really like uh, instructive and informative for me as well. I'm definitely in a different position and that I'm not like a, like a creative, like artist, I guess I'm a writer, but I am like running a company and I run a newsletter. I do have a, like a Patreon page that, um, that I guess supports my work independently, which is great. Um, but definitely, yeah, a different like uh, world community wise. Um, oh gosh, in terms of how to wrap this up. Oh yeah, I guess one, one more thing. This, is, this goes back to like an earlier audience question in terms of um, like an attitude shift. And yeah, I guess this does also build off of what um, Matt also said about the, the notion of independence not actually being like individualized. I think the myth of the you know, singular creative genius is still uh, super rampant today and can be very damaging in terms of um, good to go down to the, the nitty gritty like business details, like not crediting people and then like them not getting paid. And, you know, there's a story about um, in the LA Times about, you know, the person who Daft Punk sampled and one of their biggest songs, like now being homeless. Uh, so, so many. And of course, you know, he was a, a black musician, like so, so many stories of that, um, unfortunately. So that said, so if we, I guess, look outside of like crypto and look at the world of like influencers, um, social media influencers and the quote unquote creator economy, which is 
um, I think it, which was initially like even more uh, like dramatically promoting this notion of like the individual like DIY, like, you know, like a uh, creator working totally on their own, building their own business completely on their own. Um, now they're more and more report, uh, sorry, reports of like burnout and like, oh, I can't just, you know, be like creating content, quote unquote, 24 seven. It's just not sustainable for, for anybody. Um, so there are interesting companies coming up in that creator influencer world that are encouraging more uh, collective, like, like more collaboration or just more collective ways of running business. Um, one company that comes to mind and, and there are a lot of com other similar companies in this space is, is Stir, like being able to, even, for example, like even making it easier to um, uh, like, I like guess split revenue from a particular source, like as from this particular YouTube video that you worked on and published with like all the people who uh, worked on that video with you. Uh, it's a pretty manual process right now, but they're like, you know, FinTech products. Um, doesn't get quite into DeFi, someone was asking about in, in the comments, but just like incrementally, there are products being made that just make it easier to uh, just work collectively with other people, um, let alone, you know, like, just, I guess, compensate them more fairly. So uh, yeah, I guess just to wrap up just that, that mindset and it ties to, I think a lot of what we talked about is really important. Yeah, it is just not, uh, I was thinking of, um, <laughs> this is a whole other conversation, but like BitClout, where you can like create your own, like, <laughs> like token, like branded by yourself is probably the most extreme version of this, like very individualized neoliberal, you know, like view on the future of uh, the creator economy of the economy generally. So yeah, I would encourage people to, especially, you know, with Web3 decentralized tech, just like uh, try to ingrain like collaboration and community more into future applications as opposed to just this very, you know, yeah, like singular individualized view on music and art in general. Amazing. I love that. I couldn't have summated this conversation better myself. Um, I guess, yeah, now that we're at the end of this, I wanted to thank you all for um, your like amazing words. I know I've like learned a lot in the course of the last two hours and I hope that everyone else has as well. Um, thank you to all the people watching and asking questions. It's been really amazing to see everybody so um, like, participating. Uh, and I dropped the link in the chat, but we have a brand new Coco Discord. Uh, so would love to like keep chats going on in there. Um, also big shout out to the Water Music Discord. Uh, it's actually how I was connected with uh, uh, Zola Jesus and Verite, um, which is wicked. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, join uh, our Discord. Hopefully we can have more chats there. Uh, the like Music Futures series continues throughout the rest of the month. Uh, next Wednesday, same time, same place, we're talking about avatars. Um, and uh, Trevor McFedries is going to join us. Uh, Danielle Braithwaite-Shirley um, and some other uh, artists are going to join us for the conversation. So I think that one should be really wicked, um, as this one has been. Um, also, big shout out to uh, Music Board Berlin and the Ryerson Communication and Design Society for helping make this happen. Um, we couldn't have done it without them. Cheers, everyone. Have a wonderful Thanks so day. Much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank love you. Chat. Ciao. So lovely chat. Bye. Ciao. Be safe. Bye.